we call upon Fadir to Sheikh Muhammad bin Yahya and Ninawi to speak to us about the hadith of the hadith of the 73 sects, which is sometimes not properly interpreted, and we don't know the true essence and asal of that hadith properly. So, Faliyatafadal Mashkura Sayyidi, please enlighten us. Jazakumullah. So really the idea, to be honest with you, was not intended to be in English. I don't think I can really do it. It's really supposed to be in Arabic for scholars, but I don't want to say you're not welcome to be there. I'm going to try to do it in English, but it's not going to be sufficient. So that's the. Uh, so you have to forgive me, and if it doesn't make sense to you, don't feel obliged to remain sitting. Uh, nobody takes offense to that. I know everybody have, has things to do, so you're encouraged to do what you think is good for your time, but the idea is that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Among the things, the ayahs that Allah Ta'ala mentions to Quran, وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمِ Tafarruq, separation, after ilm comes. Not before ilm. And Allah says also, وَمَا تَفَرَّقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَبَ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَ So bayina and knowledge came to them, and then they split the people of the book. And therefore, I mentioned that the Ummah may actually separate from the path of Haq, even if it has the book of Haq. Having the book doesn't mean it's actually a guarantee if we don't follow the book, obviously. Uh, one very important hadith, obviously, that's brought always about the splitting of the Ummah is the hadith of the 73 sects. And uh, I looked at the hadith for a long time because the hadith is really important in the sense that it is the basis. Most of the scholars wrote, many of the scholars wrote about this hadith, and actually uh, they built on it. In fact, the whole ilm of firaq or the ilm of sects within the Muslim tradition is based on this hadith that there will be 73 sects, all of them in Jahannam except one. And the one who examines, I said, the metan of this hadith with its various wording will see serious and very dangerous uh, notion in there on the unity of the ummah of la ilaha illallah and the uh, cohesiveness of its structure and the closeness of its children all of us being the children of that ummah. It deepens the divisions, it furthers, it puts wedges in the gaps, and it actually prevents closeness and love and understanding or unity without conformity. It prevents unity even if it's without conformity. In fact, the hadith, I argue, يُشَرِّعُ الْبَغْضَاء It actually legislates hatred between the ummah. Or how can one person become close to another person whom he thinks is his eminent enemy who's going to go to Jahannam anyway at the end of the trip? So what's the point? And that you can see where, where that comes, obviously. So the problem here, obviously, is attributing such talk to the Prophet wasallam, which is really something that it's just imploding of the ummah from inside, in my view. Um, uh, before we uh, go into the, I'm gonna again. This was supposed to be a technical. They, you know, but uh, supposedly they told me scholars will only come, and that means we'll talk about it, just reading the Arabic and talk about it from a meaning scholars of theology. Uh, but I guess that's not what happened. So uh, since it's a mixed uh, mixed crowd, let me try to do to see what I can. Uh, the asl of this hadith is what Imam Ahmad narrated Ibn Hibban in his Sahih. Yani that means Ibn Hibban authenticated, right? And Al Hakim also narrated in two places. And uh, Al Hadith uh, is authenticated by Al Hakim. So we have two authentications by Al Ibn Hibban, by Al Hakim, and before them also by Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi. So we have three Huffav from the 
Salaf who have authenticated the Hadith, and all of them, and I picked here the Riwayah of Abu Huraira because the Riwayah of Abu Huraira is the best Riwayah we have from a Senate perspective, and that's the Riwayah that all these three Imma authenticated, the Anit Tirmidhi, chronologically speaking, Ibn Hibban and Al-Hakim. They all authenticated the Lafadh of Abu Huraira. It's the best riwayah. Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu says that anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam aqal tafarraqati al-yahudu ala ihda wa sab'een aw ifnatayni wa sab'een firqa the yahud have split on either 71 or 72. That's the hadith. Wal nasara mithla thalik and the nasara just like that as well. وتفترق أمتي على ثلاث وسبعين فرقة and my ummah will split on 73 sects end of the hadith this is the one that al-Tirmidhi ibn Hibban and al-Hakim narrated and authenticated and without any addition to the hadith and that's what I call aslu al-hadith so this is really the Asal of the hadith, uh, of the text. Again, we're looking at it from sort of maybe Judge Desai understands these things because it's constitutional law now. I'm looking at it from, this is the constitutional text. <clears throat> and I said here, I wish that the ummah had remained on this, meaning what was authenticated by the Salaf, because the others have been narrated but not declared authentic, just narrated. And this one, this text here doesn't really say anything except saying that the Yahud split on 71 or 72 sects or groups, the Nasara also like that, and my Ummah will split on 73. Nothing about Jahannam, nothing about Jannah, nothing about anything. Just saying maybe there will be what kind of groups, what kind of things, nothing is said about that. And I think if we uh, remained on such narration, we would be much better off from my perspective. And again, I welcome disagreements and I tolerate that. I respect that, actually. Uh, and I wished uh, that the Ummah had stayed, though in my view, despite the authentication of these three Imma, I believe that there is ilal, there are hadithi defects in this very narration, which is still better than the others. All right. So this is the asal of the hadith. On top of the hadith, the asal, there is two ziyadat, or there's two additions. So this where everybody narrated, and then there is addition on this. The first addition is the ziyad al-ula, kullu al-firaq fi nar except one. The ziyad, the first one, says all the sects are in Jahannam, so which means now the Yahud split on 71 or 72 sects, the Nasara like that. My Ummah will split on 73 sects. Now the addition comes, all of them in Jahannam. All my Ummahs in Jahannam except one sect. That's the first addition. There's another addition to that, which is what? Identifying either the Jahannami uh, groups or the Jannati groups. So there's two additions. This is number one. This is number two. This addition says that all of them in Jahannam except one, and those will go to Jannah are those. This is their description. Those that will go to Jahannam are those. So it seeks to identify the names of the Jannati groups or the Jahannami groups, either by name or by description. And I say all the ziyadat, all the additions are weak, or actually forged entirely, all of them. Uh, just to give you an, an understanding of what some of these uh, additions to the asal of the hadith, which I believe is still problematic, but you have to respect that there's uh, some of the greatest scholars of hadith a thousand years ago who declared it authentic, three of them to be exact, uh, but the additions are problematic. One of the additions is not problematic. And one of the additions says that 71 the Yahud or 72, Nasara 71 or 72, my Ummah will be split on 73, all of them in Jahannam except one. And the one that is saved are all the people of Islam, Ahlul Islam. Yeah? 
sounds right. Sounds right in the sense here, meaning sounds benign. There's no problem with that because obviously it means what? The saved ones are Ahlul Islam, which means all the people of Islam. So that's, uh, you can say then, how can the Ummah then, how can say how, how can he say that the Ummah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Ummah will be split? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sent to the world. So everybody is his Ummah, whether they believe in him or they don't believe in him. Those who don't believe in him are called the Ummah of Da'wah because he calls them. Those who believed in him are the Ummah of Ijaba. They actually gave the jawab and answered his call. So this is one of understanding. Though still it's a weak addition, but it's a, this addition is benign. The other addition says that everyone in Jahannam except one, and that one that's saved is Al Jama'ah. Just Al Jama'ah. Jama'ah linguistically means group. Which group? Everybody thinks it's them. And even into Ahl Sunnah, every group thinks it's them. The other one is not. Another addition everyone is in Jahannam except one. Who are they? As Sawad wal A'zam, the majority. So this addition makes the truth based on the numbers of those who follow it which is problematic, uh, logically speaking anyway, and hadithi speaking still, because if what determines truth is the majority, we're in trouble. We all are in trouble. Um, the truth is truth, is a standard in and of itself. It shouldn't be based on how many people participate to it in general. Uh, the other addition, uh, fourth addition, I'm just going through many additions. The fourth addition is the addition that says the all of them in Jahannam except one, and that one that's following the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. That's also a good addition in a sense. It's not uh, too exclusive because it sets the standard. But also it puts the Sahaba as well, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, as a standard here, which is, uh, again, we will see from an Usuli perspective that the companions, radiallahu anhum, though they are the most honorable, uh, after the prophets and they're all stars Allah be pleased with all of them but they are not legislative infallible legislative source they are obliged to follow the source which is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after the quran they don't legislate they follow legislation so there's an important thing because otherwise you make them legislators and they're not they're followers rather than legislators uh, another addition says, all of them in Jahannam except one will be saved. And the one that will be saved, the addition says, Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And that's mentioned by Shahrastani. And Shahrastani says then in his riwayah, who are Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? The hadith allegedly says, right? Uh, he says, Wama Sunnah wal Jama'ah qala ma ana alayhi al yawm wa ashabi. Right? That's the narration. What I am today and my companions. Again, this narration, the meaning I found is find is all right, it, yet it is not authentic. Another addition to the hadith: all of them are going to be pair, going to be go to they're going to go to Jahannam except one, one saved one. Who are the saved ones? Ashabul Hadith, the people of Hadith only. Yani people of Rai or people of Fiqh, of Hanafi Fiqh, they're all in Jahannam. Well, that's how it was in the old days. In the old days, there was two camps: the people who were literal literal legislators and people who were jurists. Jurists interpreted, they looked at the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law. And Ashab al-Hadith oftentimes looked at the letter of the law. So this addition says, the people who look at the letter of the law are saved. Those who look at the letter and the spirit are going to Jahannam. Right? And this is mentioned by Al-Khatib in his Sharaf Ashab al-Hadith. Who are the and the Firqa Najiyah, the saved sect from 73 sects? Qala antum ya ashabul hadith. You people of the hadith, yes. The Shia also did not let that opportunity go. Since we are just saying we are the ones who are saved, they figured, guess what? We have a narration that says everybody is in Jahannam, only the Shia will be saved. Right? And that's Al Muwaffaq al Khawarizmi mentioned it. And uh, uh, the strangest thing I found the Mu'tazila, usually they stay out of this these kinds of uh, competing sectarian fights in general, especially with that. But also we have a narration that the Mu'tazila out of the 73 sects are going to be the saved ones. 
So notice now all the, we have at least eight different narrations that are additions to the origin of the text that identify who the saved and who the not saved is. And basically all of them are saying, if you take them all together, it, the whole ummah is in Jahannam. If you take everyone to say the Sunnis say the Shias and the Shias say the everyone Sunnis and the Mu'tazilis says only them, basically if you collect them all together, the whole ummah is in Jahannam. And if not, then only your small group is in Jannah, and everybody else who says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is in, Jann in Jahannam. Now, to add to the fuel in nowadays in modern societies, uh, the small groups and sects, they, many of them mention they're the only ones that are in Jannah, and the rest are in Jahannam. Among them is one of the uh, Hanbalis, a uh, modern Salafi shiyukh. Allah have uh, mercy on his soul. Uh, I don't know if he died. Maybe he didn't die. But anyway, I saw also a, uh, a lecture where he claims that the Salafis nowadays are the saved sect, and everybody else is going to Jahannam, obviously, if you take that. Uh, there are other additions that identify not the saved. These ones identify the perished sects, yani the Jahannami sects. Right? So the first now, the Ziyadat identify, the additions identify the Jannati sects. Now we have additions to the Hadith also that came and identified who is going to Jahannam. And who is going to, all of them, so the Hadith goes, the Yahud split on 71 or 72, the Nasara split on 7, like that. My Ummah will be split on 73. And the ones that will go to Jahannam are the people of Qiyas, those who use analogy. Or the people of Ra'i, those who use the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law, right? Now you know that it's not possible that the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned Ahlul Qiyas because Qiyas was developed way later as a part of the jurist sort of the whole thing, right? Another says that the, the perished uh, group is a Shia and uh, you know, it says here also that uh, one of the most, the hadith says allegedly, also the hadith actually allegedly attributed to Ali that Ali says that all the Ummah will split on 73 sects and the most deviant and the most vile are those who are Shia, right? And then you have another one also that Ibn Majah, rahimahullah, in the Sunan narrated and says that the perish, all of them in Jahannam except one. And the ones in Jahannam are the people of Irja. Yani some of the uh, fuqaha and the jurists as well whether they're Basran or Kufan. Okay. Uh, Ahlul Qadar also, those who are predestinarians, etc., etc. Um, so there's many, many different groups. There's one narration which is also very weak. I think all the additions are beyond weak, it's very weak or forged. But there's one which is interesting, so I can save you some time. And this is the Tabarani narrated the, this hadith. And uh, it says that all of them in actually Jahannam except one. I'm sorry, all of them in Jannah except one. So there you go. I certainly believe that all the additions are very weak and nothing is defect free. And it shows you the uh, inconsistencies of the, uh, in the wording of the text. It shows you also political and sectarian employment of that text. It's really to, really politically charged and sectarianly charged, and you can see that the hadith is weak. So real quick, just going through some of the riwayat, we have riwayat uh, hadith, so we have about eight narrations, eight turuq to the hadith. First is hadith Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas. Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas narrates the hadith in uh, Musnad Abd bin Humayd with a ziyada, an addition, the addition is all of the sects are in Jahannam except one, which is the Jama'ah, right? And obviously, Al-Isnad, Da'if Jiddan, I don't think, if we were just with the Mashayikh, not, no disrespect to those who are not of specialty, but then it would not make any sense to go through the uh, Sanad of the Hadith. But the Sanad of the Hadith is Da'if on Jiddan, Munkar, not just Da'if extremely weak. In fact, it's munkar. Ada hadith Sa'ad rahimahullah ta'ala. The second 
narration or the second hadith uh, of the or the second uh, route routing of the hadith is hadith Amr bin Awf al Muzani. And this is narrated by Al Hakim in his Mustadrak, Wat Tabarani, and Ibn Abi Asim, etc. And the hadith is uh, narrated also with an addition of that will be split, split. So uh, just to make again the long story short, unfortunately, uh, we can't go through the whole thing. Uh, the hadith is also the common link. Yani Madar al Hadith is ala uh, one narrator. His name is Kathir bin Abdullah, and he's considered a forger, or you abandon him in the science of hadith. So the hadith is actually also uh, very weak and. Uh, uh, and, and discarded, to be honest with you. Though, despite that, this narration here, yani the narration of Awf, uh, Amr, uh, Kathir bin Awf al-Muzani, it says that the saved sect are the people of Islam, which actually the meaning is, is, is all right. But just because the meaning is right doesn't mean it's actually authentically attributed to the Prophet There are many wisdoms out there. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily from the Prophet It's not... Because once we say the Prophet وسلم, said something, it becomes deen. Deen is something, wisdom is others. Maybe you have wisdom, that, that's something. Deen means ways of you to see what the way to for the creation to identify their creator and live as such. So anyway, the sec third riwayah of the hadith is from the Sahabi of uh, Abu Umama or Abi Umama rahimahullah ta'ala. And this is narrated by Ibn Abi Shayba or others. And uh, this is all on the on Abu Ghalib. Uh, this is one of the stronger narrations, but still uh, the hadith at the end of the day. Hadith has many ilal means defects. Again, I, we don't have the industrial time to go through it right now. Uh, Wallahu alam. So therefore, uh, I'm just going to move to say that at the end of this hadith, because I examine every narrator in the hadith, uh, in the chain of narration and I try to see uh, how every narrator stands and uh, their narration and cross-reference their narration in a comprehensive comparative analysis so that's why it takes takes time it would only make sense to those scholars who are in the field uh, therefore at the end of the, the discussion of the hadith of Abu Umama uh, on this narration all these are defective and weak and uh, cannot actually reach the level of authenticity to start with. Um, now, we have the fourth narration is also Anas bin Malik's through Anas bin Malik and also the hadith of Anas bin Malik is da'if as well. So let me just go through that. Uh, and... Uh, not mentioned. Anas bin Malik has also it's narrated from him through many ways. Uh, Riwaya anyway is weak. Anyway, so the uh, the summary here that al Hadith with all this all these defects are all weak, and uh, that's why al Bukhari Muslim, uh, what Tirmidhi when say Abu Dawood they all avoided this narration from Anas, and Ibn Majah narrated Rahimahullah bi'ilaliha with all its defects. Uh, right. Uh, he, it's it's a common thing. I said that Ibn Majah narrates in his Sunan because with their ilal, with their defects, he narrated more than a thousand hadith with their defects to show you the defects. Okay. The fifth path or the fifth route to this hadith is hadith Amdullah bin Amr ibn al As, and the addition of this hadith all in Jahannam except one, and the one that's saved is what I am and my companions on. Right, and um, this hadith is uh, uh, narrated by Al Hakim, rahimahullah taala. Uh, so when when we say here that ma ana alayhi wa ashabi, that which I am and my companions are on, it's important that when we put the name of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the name of the Sahaba, is tashrifun lahum. La tashrikun lahum, which means that the Prophet's name 
being put with the companions is to honor them, not to make them part of the message. He is the prophet who receives wahi. Uh, they are the ones who follow the standard, which is the wahi. Right? So it's important to do that. لأن الصحابة رضوان الله عليهم أجمعين متبعون لا مبتدعون They don't innovate. They follow the legislation. ومأمورون باقتفاء الكتاب والسنة لا مشرعون They don't legislate themselves. طيب ولا يمكن أن يكون ميزانا للهداية إلا بقدر اتباعهم واقتفائهم للنبي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وأزواجه وسلم They're only a, 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 a light of following or a role model is by how much they are close to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and therefore you probably I mentioned also by, by the way حديث أصحابي كالنجوم you probably may have heard that my companions are like the stars anyone you follow you'll be guided absolutely not right absolutely not why not because the hadith itself is forged the hadith is a forgery or at least to say extremely weak no there is no sanad of this hadith that's free from matruk or kathab or wadda or daif all of them comprehensively but the reason for that is because Hidayah comes only from the book and the Sunnah. Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi. Hidayah is not confined into people except the Prophets alayhim salatu wassalam. So that's important, right? To understand. And therefore you see Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they disagreed with each other in many issues and not always they were right. And therefore they went back, some of them who did not know, went back to those who among them who knew. And those who knew among them went back to Al-Kitab was Sunnah. We follow the Sahaba in exhausting our effort to follow the book and the Sunnah, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, not to make them a standard of infallible uh, deen. And that's similar, those who go to that are similar to the Shias, for example, who also institutionalized a standard after the Prophet وسلم, in Ahlul Bayt and they said they are the standard of the deen after the Prophet وسلم. but we as Ahlul Sunnah as you all know the standard is only the book and the Sunnah everybody after the book and the Sunnah is obliged to follow the book and the Sunnah starting from the Sahaba but why do we love the Sahaba so much because when they disagreed they went back to the ulama among them and the ulama among them raju'a ha'ula ila hukm al-kitab was Sunnah so they showed us a process of when we disagree, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ All right? So you رَدُّوهُ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ All right? So that's important here. Uh, I just mentioned that. طبعاً لأنه why? The hidayah is only خير الهدي هديو محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم حديث في صحيح مسلم You all know it. That's where the hidayah is. In the Quran is ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه أو لا ريب لأنه تعانق الوقف right here as you all know ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى الهداية فيه then وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الهداية is عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله so that's important طيب very nice with that uh, And therefore, Allah Ta'ala in Surah Tawbah, you see, when he said, السَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ Notice the condition. بِإِحْسَانِ رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنهم. So, السَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ Why they were so praised? Because they رَدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Now, that's how we understand these texts. And no, we cannot make a new standard after the, except if there is ijma' of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum ajma'een. Tayyib. The kalam also, the same talk, the same kind of hadith uh, that you have uh, on my, alaykum, afwan, bi'ayyihum muqtadaytum muqtadaytum, anyone you follow, you'll be guided. The same weakness of the hadith applies to the hadith of al-irbad, right? Hold on to my sunnah and the sunnah of the khulafa al-rashideen min ba'di. Well, hadith obviously da'if, was ziyada ziyada munkara shadha right i talked about it here in in in, in
in all its narrations because we can't you can't have any standardization after the book and the sunnah so as you probably already know because that's legislation i don't want to spend time on this one on this hadith here hadith al-irbad radiyallahu anhu lakin turuq turuq an al-irbad kulluha kulluha da'ifa and and there's no point let me just keep it with the first hadith tariq al-muhasir tariq tirab al-ruwad etc Okay, very nice. We go back to the hadith of the 73 sects. We have the riwayah of Auf bin Malik. And this riwayah has three additions, actually. All of them in Jahannam except one. Who are they? Al Jama'ah, the group. All of them in Jahannam except one. Who are the Jahannami? The people of Qiyas, yani the Hanafis at that time. Uh, who, that's, yeah. who are they? They're all in Jahannam except one. Who are in Jannah? are those who are there when Asham, the Levant, is conquered. Those are the Jannati ones. Yani Asham means Syria, right? So that's the riwayah of Auf bin Malik al-Ashja'i, a Kufan Sahabi, and it's in Ibn Majah's Sunan, as you know, in Abi Asim, Walla Lukai as well. Oh, uh, Al-Isnad has issues, without a doubt. There is no, there's no doubt in that. Um, So I don't want to spend time with the narrators because it becomes a bit of a long story. All right. So uh, basically, the Asanid, all of them are weak here to uh, Auf bin Malik al Ashjai, and therefore the, his narration, his narration is weak. The seventh narration or the seventh way is Hadith Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. And also it says that all of the Ummah is in Jahannam except one. And then it describes the saved one. And the one that's saved is Al-Jama'ah. Right? Al-Jama'ah. And this is narrated by Ahmad in his Musnad, Abu Dawood, uh, etc. So among the most. And uh, the riwayah is based on Safwan bin Amr. A seksaki, obviously, um, you know, you see it's a working document, so I, you know, you never should review your books, because if you do, you're going to always rewrite them. That's what I do, unfortunately, so I look at things and I rewrite. Tayyib. So uh, there is uh, this way of Muawiyah uh, also is not just like the riwayah of Auf, really, and the rest of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, so far, uh, it's weak. And uh, especially because one of the narrators is Azhar. And, uh, you know, he's not really, a, Azhar was not really a thiqa. There's issues with him as well, um, etc. But I always say the riwayah yani of Muawiyah here, for example, it says al-jama'ah or the riwayah ma'ana alayhi wa ashabi. If you interpret, to, interpret it to be the sunnah, to be all the Muslims, to be the ummah, I think it may have something. I also put an addition here uh, with the naming of al-jama'ah. When did the naming of the jama'ah start? The evolution of the concept of the word jama'ah. How did it evolve? And also, itlaqat al-ism, the application of the name of jama'ah. What is the name of jama'ah? The reason for that is because at the prophetic time, all Muslims were called the jama'ah. It was jama'atul mu'mineen versus jama'atul kafirin. So you were with the jama'ah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was at the prophetic time. And then the jama'ah al-musallin. And then the other jama'ah is, they basically is not to split. But eventually this concept of jama'ah evolved, evolved to carry lots of things. So one also needs to look at that. But we don't have time now to examine the ahadith that says that. In my view, that anything that came from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's sahih, 
that talked about the jama'ah, la yumkinu hamluhu illa ala al-ummah. It only means the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu entirely. Fal-khuruju ala al-jama'ah fi ahdihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khurujun ala al-islam wa ahlihi wa jama'atihi wa nabiyyih. Lianno jama'atuhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hiya ummatu al-mu'minin and the rest are munafiqeen or kafirin. That's how it was in the old days. Anyway, so it becomes another, we'll talk about that maybe some other time. And also I put a chapter that al-maqsood min al-jama'ah, what, what we mean by the jama'ah, not the linguistic sense, which means al-adad, meaning the more people. Because that this way, you put the more, the number, as the a standard of being truth, uh, the truth, which is a problem. Al Quran actually doesn't really go there. وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنٍ وَإِنْ تُطَعْ أَكْثَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّكَ سَبِيلَ اللَّهِ until today. So uh, this issue. I also in this book I sort of put really three, four books together just so because they're close. I, I examined also all the ahadith that came in anything had to do with Al Jama'ah. I also examined all the ahadith, all of them, that speak about as-sawad al-a'zam. And uh, so I don't want to go there now because it'll take us a long time. But I, I just gave you basically the, the summary of all that. Uh, wallahu alam. Wallahu alam. There is no final word. These are just all right, so I said anyway, uh, the summary is that the shari'i usage of the word jama'ah in the prophetic time, sallallahu alayhi wa azwajihi wa alihi wa sallam wa sahabi wa sallam, is not as in the era after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because the, terminal, the term al-jama'ah has evolved politically and religiously, etc., uh, etc. Et and to uh, al-jama'ah in the, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's era, and uh, the era of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, in my view, is al-jama'a alati tattabi' wa tuqaddimu al-Qur'ana wa sunnah inda al-ikhtilaf. Al-jama'a that brings and prioritizes the Qur'an and the sunnah when there is matter of difference and does not prioritize anything over them, irrespective of whether few or lot. That's a jama'a based on the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, actually, what I put here, but again, some other time. The eighth narration to the hadith of the 73 sects is the narration of Abu Huraira, which I think is the most authentic. And that's the narration, that's the only narration authenticated by the A'imma uh, such as, or exclusively, not such as, only Ibn uh, uh, Al-Tirmidhi, Ibn Hibban, Al-Hakim, Rahimahumullahu Ajma'in wa Radiya Anhum. They all authenticated the riwayah of Abu Huraira out of all other eight, seven narrations, seven different routes to the, to the text itself, right? Because the narration is, let's say the chains are like here, one is narrating through one, is narrating through one, is narrating through one, is narrating that the Prophet Wasallam said this. So we have eight different ways. Etc. right? So out of all the eight different ways, these three scholars, they picked, the others did not like, Al-Bukhari and Muslim did not put it at all in their narration whatsoever. Did not include it at all. But At-Tirmidhi, Ibn Hibban, al Hakim, they picked the riwayah of Abu Huraira, radiyallahu anhu, and they included it as and they said this is authentic. And that narration of Abu Huraira, as at Tirmidhi narrates in his Jami', Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, the Yahud split on 71 or 72 sects, and Nasara like that, just like that, did not say 72, for example, etc. And my Ummah will split on 73 sects. End of the hadith, right? Abu Isa Tirmidhi said, Hadith Abi Hurayrata, notice out of all of them, because he has seen them, not just you and me. He said, the hadith of Abu Hurayrah, Hasanun Sahih. That's a big thing for a Tirmidhi to say, right? Abu Dawood said the same thing, Ibn Majah, etc. So 
Ibn Hibban, the same thing Al-Hakim said. And Al-Hakim said this, uh, يعني, even further than what At-Tirmidhi said. After he narrated the hadith, almost the same wording, except here now, the wording is slightly different. The Yahud split on 71 or 72 sects, and the Nasara split on 71 on sev or 72 sects. So not mithla dalik, now it's just the addition is there. And my Ummah will split on 73 sects. Imam al-Hakim said this after this. Imam al-Hakim, as you know, one of the big a'imma of hadith, he died year four or five of hijrah. Rahimahullah, his famous book is Al-Mustadrak. He said, هذا حديث صحيح على شرط مسلم. This hadith is sahih, fulfilling the criteria of Imam Muslim's authentication. Though they did not narrate the hadith or did not put it in their collection. And then he says, وَلَهُ shawahid," Which means it has corroborative evidences. Usually when you say that, it indicates weakness. Why would you need corroborating evidence if it's authentic on its own? You wouldn't need that. It's good on its own from a hadith perspective. Anyway, then he said, Al-Hakim trying to explain why it is authentic, fulfilling the conditions of Muslim. Because you all know from a hadith perspective, the most authentic book in hadith is Al-Bukhari. Then Muslim in that tartib, right? Uh, obviously, if a hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim both, then even higher. So, but if Muslim authenticates it, that's a big thing. That's a sahih hadith, basically. But the Imam al-Hakim said it's authenticated according to Muslim, and the Imam Muslim used Muhammad bin Amru's the chain. Muhammad bin Amru through Abu Salama, through Abu Huraira. This is a, يعني, an accepted chain to the Imam Muslim. Hence, al-Hakim says it is authentic fulfilling the conditions of Muslim. They're all his narrators, etc. So that's in general. I said this is the Turuq. So I put the Turuq of all Abu Huraira's riwaya because you need to be comprehensive when you examine all narrations to the text that we're studying here. And notice that this narration does not mention that there's a saved sect, nor does it mention that there are Jahannami sects. Doesn't mention anything. It just mentions that they will be splitting. People will be splitting. All right? So I said that, wallahu a'lam, that the authentication of this narration by Imam al-Tirmidhi, Ibn Hibban, wal hakim is a questionable for two implicit defects, not explicit, implicit. Uh, and that is because the common link, or madar, madar al-hadith, madar, Madar means the common link of the hadith. Yani the hadith, for example, goes from an Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let's say in this case, Abu Huraira, and Abu Huraira sends it, gives it, let's say, to people in the chain. Usually, you'll have uh, other people as well, let's say, in the chain, etc., etc. But there's usually a common link. From him, the hadith goes up. So that's what's called Madar. The common link here is Muhammad bin Amru al -Layfi, right? You see here Al-Hakim is saying Muhammad bin Amru. That's the common link, man. He narrates it through Abu Huraira, through, through Abu Salama, through Abu Huraira. Muhammad bin Amru is Saduq, not Thiqa. Saduq in Hadith means his Hadith is Hasan, not Sahih. So less than authentic, but acceptable. Yet, Muhammad bin Amru al -Layfi, is considered also has some softness, weakness. And some of the ulama of hadith actually declared him weak, straightforward, not because he's uh, not truthful, but because of his dabt, his accuracy in transmission of the hadith is not intact. So, and they also said he's lahu awham. Lahu awham means he has delusions when he actually talks. So therefore his narration is not really intact. No wonder Imam Muslim did not narrate his hadith um, in this. So that's why Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al taqrib said, Saduq lahu awham. Taba'an huwa mashhoor Muhammad bin Amr al-Layfi because he's among the shiyukh of Malik. Lakin saduqun takallama fihi ba'duhum min qibali hifzih. He is truthful, but some of the scholars of hadith in the old days spoke about him meaning warning from his weak memory.
So therefore, uh, and then also Al-Uqayli with Dara Qutni, Wal-Waqidi, all of them declared him da'if. Once we have disagreement about a narrator from an industrial perspective now here, saying, well, you know, some say this narrator is okay, some say this narrator is weak. You have a narrator in question. This hadith is not authentic anymore. There's no agreement on his absolute truthfulness and trustworthiness. It's a questionable trustworthiness due to not his truthfulness, but due to his accuracy in transmission of hadith. Therefore, this hadith can never be authentic, just on that mere fact. Once there's disagreement, especially from big huffaz, calling him weak. And especially that he lacks and he has delusions, etc. Just being one of the shiukh of Malik doesn't mean anything, right? As you all know. In hadith, everyone is studied on his own. Another thing I said, the other implicit defect that we have is that Muhammad bin Amr al-Layfi, rahimahullah himself, he narrates the hadith through one man. His name is Abu Salama, who narrates it through Abu Huraira. Abu Salama is a tabi'i, right? And I say this link here is defective, ma'lul. Therefore, Imam al-Hakim saying that Imam Muslim uh, actually sees that this chain, Muhammad bin Amr and Abi Salama, uh, Salama and Abi Huraira, as good is not really uh, true, uh, if you really examine it. Al-Hadith actually contrary to what Sayyidina al-Imam al-Hakim rahimahullah wa radiya anhu said is not really fulfilled, does not really fulfill the conditions of Muslim to authenticate because al-Imam Muslim never ever used Muhammad bin Amru munfaridan on his own in any narration, never. If he narrated, if Imam Muslim narrated for Muhammad bin Amru, he always narrated Muhammad bin Amru and someone else. When the ulama of hadith narrate one hadith from exactly two people and they never leave one man alone, it tells you that that man on his own is not strong, weak. That's why I add another with him. And therefore, Kalamul Imam al-Hakim, rahimahullah wa anhu, who is Imam Hafiz, radiyallahu anhu wa rahimah, lakin does not hold water. Al-Imam Muslim only narrated fil mutabahat uh, and uh, actually Dhahabi mentioned that for Talkhis and said Muslim Mahtajabi Muhammad bin Amru Munfaridan Bal bin Dimamihi ila Gayrihi. And therefore this these both defects and I say that's why Al Imam Muslim and others did not narrate this whole hadith of the seventy three sects. Well Al Bukhari, right? Despite its fame and despite its magnitude of importance and devastating effects, the reason for that, obviously, not because they were stupid or they did not see the famous narrations, but because they did not, you have to assume that in a sense, they did not see them, this kind of narration, which is big, they did not view it as authentic. It did not fill their conditions, nor did it merit to be narrated by them, both of them, Rahimahumullah ta'ala al-Bukhari Muslim. Though I said that the matin of Abu Huraira has no problem, to be honest with you. Yani it could be, if the Senate is authentic, it could be that the Ummah will be split based on the different understandings, different ijtihadat. Without one has to be in Jahannam and everybody in Jannah, or one, all of them in Jahannam and one in Jannah. Maybe you can understand it because people have different understanding of the law different ways of seeing the spirit versus the letter of the law and they apply their best understanding of the law and guess what when you apply your best understanding of the letter of the law you will have various understanding and various uh, application of the law a dynamic application of the law and you could say if the hadith is authentic and to me it's not at this point uh, but the Imam al-Tirmidhi wal hakim ibn Hibban authenticated it you could see it as a mu'jiza, a miracle for the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi foretelling about the ghaib, the unseen, that the ummah, number one, will uh, do taqlid of other nations, like the Yahud and Nasara, in having different deductions from the text. They see the text, it's a human thing. They see the text in different ways. And that's it, foretelling about a reality. Okay, we have another ninth narrations, but I did not mention it. It's not, it's not as, 
has to the core it's Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Mas'ud's hadith does not mention even about our ummah it only mentions about that the Yahud split on the 73 not our ummah at all we're not even there right uh, there is also the hadith of Abu Umama wa Anas wa Atila wa Uwaymir. They're weak, uh, too, too weak. Uh, there's, uh, so I didn't really mention them because I put them here in Kathir uh, al-Falastini. Al-Falastini munkarun jiddan. Yani he, and Yazid al-Dimashqi munkar jiddan. So his, Ahmad says, a hadith hu mawdu'a. It's forged a hadith, straightforward, so I don't want to mention that. There's also the hadith of Ibn Abbas, also weak. And this hadith says that the Yahud split on 71 sects, the Nasara on 72 sects, and you will be split on 73 sects. And the most deviant and evil and wretched are the Shia that, sh that, sl that slander Abu Bakr wa Umar radiallahu anhumah. The hadith is weak, obviously slandering a Muslim is a fusuq, let alone slandering a Sahabi like Abu Bakr and Umar. May Allah Ta'ala be well pleased with them. Um, uh, same thing, Hadith Ali. Hadith Ali is also weak. Ibn Abi Asim, among the Aima of the Salaf in his Sunnah, uh, narrated it, and also extremely weak, beyond weak, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't think I need to go through the rest of the Hadith uh, as far as narrations. Uh, I mentioned few things. Now, looking, now this was all I said here. The summary from all examining all the narrations of the hadith there is not one sanad of this hadith that is defect free not one but nakara is almost in every single chain and therefore not one of them will ever amount to authentic on its own wallahu ta'ala alam including the hadith of abu huraira which is the most authentic out of all of them, yet it's still weak in my view, Allahu A'lam. Tayyib. Now I'm looking at the metan of the hadith. Why is the hadith problematic from a text of the hadith? Now, we've examined the chains to the hadith. Now we examine the metan because the hadith is a chain, right? So one narrates it through others all the way to the Prophet Sallallahu and then you have the text of the hadith. So let's examine the problems of the chain of the hadith. Well, the chain of the hadith, not just the, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the chain of the hadith is problematic, but not just the chain, the text of the hadith is also problematic. Why? Because Allah in the Quran says, Kuntum khayra ummah ukhrijat linnas. You are the best of ummah that came, ever came to people. And, well, kathalika ja'alnakum ummatan wasata. We made you an ummah that is of moderation and wasat. And the hadith of splitting into 73 sects, especially with its additions, make the ummah, this ummah, the most evil and most divisive. Not khair ummah, most divisive of ummahs, because the Yahud split on 71, Nasara on 72, you will be split on 73. You are the most divisive of ummahs, not khair ummah. Straightforward, right? Because Allah says, "Women, the ladies who said, 'Inna sara akhadna mithaqahum, fanasu hadda mimma dukirubeh, faagreina bainahum al-adawa wa al-baghda ila yom al-qiyama.' They are split because of adawa and baghda, and now you'll be even split more than them, right? Verses Allah says about our ummah: 'Wadkuru ni'mat Allah 'alaykum idh kuntum a'da'an fa'alfa bainah kulubikum fa'asbahtum bi ni'matihi ikhwana.' Right?" Another also problematic issue with the text of the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ told us that his ummah is ummah marhuma. And, and division and all of them in Jahannam is not rahmah. Where is the rahmah if, if, if the out of 73, 72 will go to Jahannam? Right? Al hadith li rawal bazzar rahimahullah ta'ala, warwat al hadith riwat al rijal al Bukhari wa Muslim. Except the Mas'udi, who is a Bukhari, قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمتي أمة مرحومة. My أمة is أمة that has received رحمة. So therefore, um, also there's other things I said that actually uh, has have a problem with the metan of the hadith. Um, I don't want to. There's too many things. I think maybe some other time. Uh, 
Um, I said we make and we can understand. I try to explain the 73 sects, 72 of them going to Jahannam. Maybe going to Jahannam, la khalidina fiha, not everlastingly. So the Ummah is all 73 sects. 73, 72 out of them will go to Jahannam for punishment, temporary punishment of sins they've acquired. And only one sect will go without hisab. Right? So, yani Allah mentioned about some people that will go to Jahannam, for example, in the Yakuruna Amwala Liatama, those who eat the money of the orphans. In Yakuruna fi butuni him nara they will go to Jahannam but not necessarily ending and always everlasting in Jahannam and therefore yani, ulama ahl sunnah wal jama'ah we don't yani, they don't believe and we follow them obviously that the mu'min who is muznib and sinful will everlastingly be in Jahannam so I'm saying maybe we can interpret the hadith if you want to authenticate it which I don't think it is that the 73 that's the whole ummah 72 will go to Jahannam for temporary phase to be, to, if you do the, for the crimes they committed, you do the crime, you do the time. And the 71 will go without that, right? And uh, then that's, that's reality maybe, wallahu a'lam, right? And that's because some people will obviously will go to Jahannam. You know the hadith fil Bukhari, fil Sahih, an Abdullah bin Amru. كان على ثقل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رجل يقال له كركرة. A man, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used a man, Sahabi. He, his name was كركرة, and he was in charge of the money also. So when he died, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, هو في النار. He is going to go to Jahannam. And they didn't know why the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would say that about كركرة. So they went and they found that he stole a cloak. عباء عباء. He took a cloak. He was in charge of the treasury, and he figured, you know, I can take a cloak. It's not a big deal. Nabi said, "Who in nar?" So, ay, يعني يعذب على معصيته. Abu Hafiz bin Hajar says, "Ah, who was in nar? In lam yaf Allah an." Regardless, it means some will go to Jahannam, including, for example, maybe Karkara, or not, or maybe he's in a nar if Allah does not punish him. And the others will go to Jannah. That may be something good that we take from the Hadith. If you want, if you are among in the in the view that the Hadith is Sahih, they will go to Jan to Jahannam. Uh, uh, the seventy-two will go to Jahannam. Uh, the point here is because if you say all my ummah, my ummah, my ummah will be split on seventy-three sects. Seventy-two will go to Jahannam. If they are kuffar, they're no longer his ummah. Why would he say my ummah? From my ummah, will, 72 will abandon Islam and they will go to Jahannam. Because the Nabi وسلم, says in the authentic hadith, hadith al-Bukhari fi sahih Kullu ummati yadkhuluna al-Jannah. All my ummah will enter Jannah. Not 72 of them will actually enter Jannah. All my ummah will enter Jannah, illa man aba, except those who don't want to. Who doesn't want to go into Jannah? Who will not want to? Who obeys me, enters Jannah, who doesn't, will, has, has rejected Hadith al Bukhari. So that shows you again that if it is 70, actually, if there is such an authenticity, the 72 could not be out of the Ummah, part of the Ummah, maybe that will go temporarily and then be paroled and pardoned after that i said also the split may be in a sp specific to time or space etc wallahu alam but not the whole ummah yani the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that deen started gharib and will also come back as gharib strange right so i put other things that i think that it contradicts the text of the of the of the hadith uh, Well, Ghazali has a nice thing for Faisal uh, where he actually says, he says, 
ظاهر of the text is ظني the, the outward of the text is implicit and ambiguous and uh, those who are going to go to Jahannam right he says are those who actually are entirely kuffar they have left the deen already يعني. so that's something also to look at All right wallahu alam because to us ahl sunnah the one who does sins is not everlastingly in Jahannam not unlike the khawarij the, the, those who do sins, they may go to Jahannam, but they're not there everlastingly. So the hadith must be also understood in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, da, 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 da. So let me not. Uh, let me just read you to maybe some, and then we'll finish, inshallah. What some of the scholars have mentioned before me about the hadith, طبعاً. Yani I'm not the first one. Some people think uh, there's many, many, many big scholars before that have mentioned it. our. Uh, one of the sheikh of our grand 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 sheikh between me and him are four. Al Qadi Shawkani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Al Qadi Shawkani said, Fi Fat Al Qadir, something nice. Al Qadi Shawkani, right, died 1250 of Hijrah, right? This supreme judge of Yemen at that time, right? Imam Al Shawkani or Ali Shawkani, Rahimahullah. Shawkani said in his book, Al Fat Al Qadir, he says, Walaqad Ahsana Ba'du Al Hufad. Some of the Hufad, Hufad means the highest level of Hadith scholars. When they said, وَأَمَّا زِيَادَةُ كُلِّهَا هَالِكَ إِلَّا وَاحِدًا The addition to the Hadith that says all of them are going to perish or all of them are going to go to Jahannam except one, فَزِيَادَةٌ غَيْرُ صَحِيحًا This ziyada is not authentic. And look what Ash-Shawkani said, which is something. He said, وَأَظُنُّهَا مِنْ دَسِيسِ بَعْضِ الْمَلَاحِدَةِ he says, I suspect it is the introjection of some uh, and the enemies of Islam and Muslims. Right? Enemies of Islam. He says, they put it, the enemies of Islam, he says, they put this addition and inserted it uh, smoothly in the texts. That's what ash you know, I didn't say that. I said it's weak. He says it's Mulhideen, the non-believers. Uh, he says, uh, did that and he says obviously Ibn Hazm, Ibn Hazm denied it also as well he says and good done good job is those who identified it that it is an introjection or a slipping of this poison by the people who are the enemies of Islam فَإِنَّ فِيهَا مِنَ التَّنْفِيرِ عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَالتَّخْوِيفِ مِنَ الدُّخُولِ فِيهِ مَا لَا يُقَادَرُ قَدَرُهُ For in this addition, it suffices to push anyone from Islam who is even thinking about Islam and making you fearful from Islam. He says, imagine someone wants to become a Muslim, but then you come and tell him, but let me tell you, you see all these Muslims, 72 out of, if you divide them into 73 groups, the 72 will be in Jahannam. All of them are in Jahannam. Only 71. But by the way, every single one claims to be the 73rd. Right? So he says that's why it's actually the Mulhideen who did that. Right? He says, فَيَحْصَلُ لِوَاضِعِهَا مَا يَطْلُبُهُ مِنَ الطَّعْنِ عَلَى هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ الْمَرْحُومَةِ And those who inserted it as a poison in the body of the Ummah, they will gain the rewards of what they now take the sifa or the attribute of the ummah marhuma, the ummah that is graced with the rahmah of Allah. It's no longer graced with the rahmah. It's actually graced with punishment and adab. It's all going to Jahannam anyway, right? Uh, as he says, right? So Shawkani has written some strong words on this in his Fathul Qadir, if you want to look it up, right? Rahimahullah ta'ala wa jazahu khayran an dhalik, right? Um, I've put other things as well. I also put what Sheikh Al Muqbili, Rahimahullah, also a Yemeni scholar, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in the old days, Yani. Sheikh Al Muqbili, he died 1108 of Hijrah, right? Sheikh Saleh bin Mahdi Al Muqbili, 1108 on Hijrah, uh, Rahimahullah. He, he was a, uh, Yani, he sought Ijtihad Mutlaq, like, and he really went after the Mu'tazila in a bad way, and after the Zaydi Shia in a bad way, and after the Ash'aris in a bad way, uh, and after the Sufis in a bad way, and after the Muqallida in a bad way. May Allah forgive him and grant him the best. 
والأشاعرة are really جمهور أهل السنة يعني we that's all what we are all أشاريز يعني most of أهل السنة are أشاريز anyway وalso uh, غزالي جنيدي سوفيز if we were to say most of أهل السنة are that but anyway that's his view but he also wrote a book actually entirely on افتراق الأمة he viewed himself as مجتهد مطلق uh, about 400 years ago uh, he was a scholar, no doubt, uh, and that's why you, saw, you see him sort of going against all sects. It didn't matter whether they're Zaydi, Shia, Sunnis, Mu'tazila, Sufis, whatever. He just said, you know, anyway. So um, he says, he says, look, he says, uh, this al firqa al-Najiya, figuring out who the saved sect is, every group says, claims that they are the saved sect, and others are all are the evil sects, right? Uh, he says there's a, a problem in that, etc. And he talks about all the problems in the hadith of that. Um, we also have, I also put some of the uh, statements of, of some of the scholars about the hadith. Al Imam Ibn Muhammad al Wazir, also one of the Mujtahideen, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, has a beautiful, one of the most beautiful books. Mujtahid, he does not belong to any madhab per se. Al-Awasim wal Qawasim, right? One of, one, of, uh, one of the big a'imma. He says, and be careful to be fooled by the addition that says all of the sects will be perished except one. فَإِنَّهَا زِيَادَةٌ فَاسِدَةٌ غَيْرُ صَحِيحَةٌ لَا يُؤْمَنْ أَن تَكُونَ مِنْ دَسِيسِ الْمَلَاحِدَةٌ This is the second one that says, he says, I'm not sure if it's not an addition and insertion by those who are fierce enemies of, this, of, the, of Islam. Right? The Shawkani says in Bal Innaha Mawdu'a and Da'afaha Jama'a. And the Shawkani Fil Fatih Bari, I mentioned Ibn Hazim Fil Fisal, also in his book Al Fisal, says, Hadani Hadithani Laya Sihani Aslan min Tariq al Isnad. They're not even authentic from an Isnad perspective. We know Imam Ibn Hazim, also one of the A'imma, obviously, in the fourth century, so he's a big man. Uh, so if something that's not authentic from an Isnad perspective, it becomes a problem. Also, some of the people of Hadith, like Al-Hafidh Zain Din Al-Musali, Al-Hafidh Ibn Al-Nahawi, etc. I also brought to you briefly what Al-Ghazali mentioned in, in Al-Faisal, right? And I think his interpretation of it is excellent if we were to take it. If you want to authenticate the Hadith, then you see the Ummah, Ummah of Ijaba, Ummah of Da'wa, the Ummah of Da'wa, is the one that did not answer the prophetic calls, so they're subject to punishment. The Ummah of Ijaba who accepted the prophetic call and walked on it, then they are the ones that marhuma. Similarly, that's what the uh, Siddiq Khan Al-Qanuji, Sayyid Siddiq Hassan Khan, I know some of uh, people, they say, clay, they say he's Wahhabi, all these things. He's a student of a Shawkani, one of the Hadith scholars, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in the old days, right? we're talking about, and he, he put it in his book, Yaqdat uh, Ulil Atibar, and he mentioned that as well. Uh, so Sayyid al qanuji mentioned that actually in his, uh, explicitly that these things are also, it's problematic. Um, some scholars in the old days wrote a special book on this, and I benefited from their book, and I referenced them uh, in that if I took from them. Among them is Al-Allama Ahmad bin Ali bin Mutir al-Shafi'i. He died year uh, 10, 1068, about 400 years ago. Al-Allama Salih bin Mahdi al-Mugbili, I told you about him. He died 1108. Al-Mujtahid, Al-Allama Al-Mujtahid, Muhammad bin Ismail al-Sanani, right? Sahib Subul al-Salam, uh, the author of Subul al-Salam as well, also wrote a book about this hadith, or same thing going more or less to when I went to, I don't think any of them took all the hadith of its, all, all its narrations in the way this poor slave did it. Not because they don't know it, they just, they just looked at it, examined it, and they just gave their sentence. And also Al-Qadi Muhammad bin Ali Shawkani, rahimahullah ta'ala, right? And in our time, uh, our Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim Abdul Ba'ath Al-Kiptani, rahimahullah, has a book called Ibra'u Al-Dhimma Bitahqiq Al-Qawli Hawla Aftiraq Al-Ummah. Lakin still, يعني, I don't think it went into every single chain and the narrators uh, in that. So I thought I wanted to uh, not add to their knowledge, but simply present that which they came to the conclusion of 
So I had to research how did they come to that conclusion, and I tried to put it all together. Um, I don't want to go and talk about why we are we, we have different. I want to end with. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala. Uh, some masail hadithiya, some issue, hadithi issues for those of you, real quick, uh, that have to do with the, uh, with this uh, case study. Number one, we have a hadith called Sahih, authentic, da'if, and we have to talk about when the narrator has sold tafarrud and mukhalafa, when the narrator is actually, uh, is the only one. Um, and I mentioned about the narrators because we need to look at the narrators and المتابعات المتابعة القاصرة زعلة also we need to bring the, the hadith and see if they are connected to the Quran if they're connected to the other hadith uh, let me see just to go through um, يعني this is just some rules في النقد الحديثي or in the critique of narrations right uh, and talking about uh, authenticating بالمتابعة والشواهد uh, with corroborative evidence or corroborative narrations some, some scholars especially the recent one started viewing that it's okay to authenticate a hadith if there's multiple weak narrations uh, so there's I've also talked about that why is that not necessarily a consistent rule in fact maybe the opposite is uh, a rule especially in different matters whether the hadith is in the category of fada'il category of ahkam or category of aqaid so the muhaddithin did not just simply authenticate the hadith all in one can one uh, bin no no They've separated. Is this hadith aqaid hadith? Is this ahkam? Is this fada'il akhbar? Authenticating hadith in the fada'il is not like authentic hadith, authenticating hadith in the ahkam. In the ahkam, I'm going to have a ruling. It's a jurisprudential deduct deduction with a ruling that's going to come. It's not the same. And let alone in the aqaid, right? And therefore, إذا انفرد الراوي عن الثقات فإن كان ثقة فحديثه غريب صحيح إن سليم من الشذوذ والعلل وإلا فهو ضعيف even if the rawi is thiqa right لأنه التفرد مظنة حلال الضبط ودخول الوهم when the rawi is the only one then that's suspicious of him being totally alone and that may be some lack of accuracy uh, or ضبط uh, in there Anyway, I don't want to take you into the technicalities, maybe for those who are in the field some other time. Um, I also put a whole chapter about مسألة تصحيح الحديث الضعيف بتعدل الطرق That means when you have multiple weak narrations, you say, well, because it's multiple weak narrations, it ought to lead you that the hadith is sahih. And I say that's what the mutaakhireen or Madrasa to Zahir al Sanad, the Madrasa of those who look at the Zahir of the Sanad. So they go and they authenticate or declare Hassan weak a hadith just merely because of many weak chains. Uh, so much that the matter became like mathematics. I have one plus two plus three plus four. Well, that ought to make it that the one it's good, and that's not necessarily how it is because. Uh, every single chain needs to be looked into and we need to look also on the narr narrators as well um, uh, for example I brought some also examples you see uh, for example Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala he says what the Sheikh Abu Amr Taban Abu Umar rahimahullah is mentioning la yalzamu min wurud al hadithi min turuq muta'addida ay yakuna hasanan Fadlan am sahih. It is not uh, necessary that the hadith comes from many different paths that it's actually hasan, good, right? So there are different things. Uh, and the same thing, Ahmad Shakir, Rahimahullah, Muhaddith al Misri, Rahmatullah, who brought Muslim Ahmad, those of you who have uh, that uh, to print, 
he says وَبِذَلِكَ يَتَبَيَّنُ خَطَأُ كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْمُتَأَخِّرِينَ this shows you how wrong many of the latter scholars يعني maybe the past four or five hundred years في إطلاقهم when they just absolutely say that الحديث الضعيف إذا جاء من طرق متعددة ضعيفة ارتقى إلى الحسن أو الصحيح that when they claim or they assume that if there are multiple weak chains that makes it Hassan or Sahih. So, yani, there's things to say. And for example, the hadith that uh, Sakhawi I brought, have the Sakhawi, when he says, Fi Fatha al Mughith, right? Fatha al Mughith, in talking about the uh, ilm of hadith, the mustalah of hadith, he says, uh, commenting on hadith, whoever memorizes 40 hadith from the Sunnah, I would be Shafi' for him in the Day of Judgment, right? He says, فَقَدْ نَقَلَ النَّوَوِيُّ اتِّفَاقَ الْحُفَّاضِ عَلَىٰ ضَعْفِهِ مَعَ كَثْرَةِ طُرُقِهِ Despite many ways, Al-Huffad went to say it's weak. So I put lots of things, Al-Hafad ibn Jama'ah as well as Sharif al-Jurjani, uh, right, uh, etc. The reason the Huffad were a bit strict, because you have to understand, the Huffad are these constitutional law, uh, law experts they look at the authenticity of it itself, not just putting all these things together, and they allow that for the jurist's application to, to, to happen, or interpretation, but they won't accept it as an authentic, actual constitution in and of itself. In order for it to be an authentic uh, con piece of constitution, it has to be solid. Now, for the jurist, they allow them to sort of apply dynamically, and that's why they did not authenticate anything that did, that uh, wasn't authentic. And that's why I say, al-da'ifu, al-hadith al-da'ifu, la yubna alayhi shay, walaw ta'addad al-turuquhu wa takatharat. Why? Li'anna al-ibrata bisihhati al-turuqi, la bikathratiha. The lesson is, is it authentic? Not just it's multiple. Okay, multiple, great. Let's see whether it's authentic. Or at least one of them is authentic. Because having multiple narrations, um, could mean many things. You know, in Umar ibn Abdul Aziz's time, they collected only 500 ahadith. The government, the state collected. By the time Ahmed bin Hanbal came, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, year 101, let's say, of Hijrah. By the time of Ahmed bin Hanbal, 241, yani 100 years, we ended up with 700,000 ahadith. From 500 to 700. Thousand, 500, 500, not 500,000, 500 even. We ended up with prophetic narrations in the, um, in the neighborhood of a million. Lots of people use the hadith to pass their own ways, pass their own things. So that's why being authentic is important. And that's why without authenticity, I don't really, it's not admissible in, in, in court, in, in the constitutional court, and obviously to constitutional people. I don't admit, I don't admit anything that's not authentic. You can't build on, any, on anything on that. You bring me something authentic, we'll talk. You're bringing something weak, uh, say, God bless you. We, we leave a message after the beep. I'm not here, because you're talking now to an answering machine. Right? It means you may use it in fada'il if you want. The problem is now, using it in fada'il became aqidah as well. No, we, there's a problem. Fada'il means you use it for fada'il, and you can't really make it binding on others nor anything. Just use it on your own. God bless you. Allah bless you. Bismillah. But now we, our problem is we took the hadith of fadail and we made them aqaid. It's all confusing. That's why Ibn Hazm says, you know, weak hadith can never be strong, khalas, no matter how many, how many turuq it has. While you see Imam al-Suyuti who came, Imam Ibn Hazm year 400, 4th century, Imam al-Suyuti year 9th century, right? He died 9-11 of Hijrah. He was known to actually uh, authenticate a hadith because of multiple ways. And I'll give you this example and I'll finish. He says, Imam Suyuti, Rahimahullah, Hafid al Suyuti, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, wa radiya anhu. He says in his book, At Ta'liq al Munifa, ala Musnadi Abi Hanifa. Nice book, right? It's the Ta'liqa, short. Munifa, ala Musnad al Imam Abi Hanifa. He talks about hadith. Uh, seeking knowledge is obligation on every Muslim. You all remember probably this hadith is famous, but it's, it's weak, very weak. And that's why 
many of the a'imma such as Ahmad ibn Hibban, Wal Bazzar, Wal Bayaghi ibn Abdul Bar, they've all seen the hadith. They said it's weak. The meaning is right. Nobody denies the meaning. You want to seek knowledge in China? Go to China and you can go to Japan if you want. South Korea is also right next door. Bismillah, no problem. North Korea, I don't know, Sheikh. North Korea. This, this brother in North Korea is eating too much chocolate and he's, happy, he's trigger happy lately. So, you know, you've got to be careful. Right? We stay, Sheikh, in safe zone. Right? So, uh, but that, that it's one, because if you say it as a wisdom, that's good. If you say it as a prophetic statement, you're saying this is deen now. You have to believe in this. And that's a problem. We separate what the Prophet ﷺ, because what the Prophet ﷺ says is deen, becomes deen. It's not, uh, let me, no versus that. So anyway, seeking knowledge is obligation upon every Muslim, right? Look what Al-Hafid al-Suyuti mentions in the Muslim of Abi Hanifa. He says, وَعِنْدِي يَقُولُ الْإِمَامُ الصُّيُوتِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِّي Imam Suyuti is a big man. He says, to me, بَلَغَ رُتْبَةَ الصَّحِيحِ It became authentic. لِأَنِّي رَأَيْتُ لَهُ نَحْوَ خَمْسِينَ طَرِيقًا I found 50 different ways leading to the hadith. وَقَدْ جَمَعْتُهَا فِي جُوزِ And I collected it all and I put it in a book. And that's why it is sahih. But Al-Bukhari saw the hadith. Muslim saw the hadith. Ibn Hibban saw the hadith. Ahmad saw the hadith. All of them saw the hadith. They didn't authenticate it. He is the first one that and no 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 he says look at that al munawi rahimahullah fi fat qadir mentions al hafiz al suyuti says wa hakamtu bi sihhatihi li ghayrihi wa lam usahih hadithan lam usbaq li tasihihi siwa i am the first one imam suyuti says who declares this hadith authentic alhamdulillah which tells you what he passed away rahimahullah in year 9 11. so for 900 years the ulama of hadith saw this hadith and they never authenticated it. And he's the first one, radiyallahu anhu wa rahimah wa nafa'na bihi, to say, I am the first to actually do it. Which tells you what? Shows you clearly what the methodology, the scientific methodology of the early constitutional scholars and hadith scholars versus the methodology of the latter ones. They've all seen it, but they didn't declare it authentic. In fact, they declared it weak, though the meaning is right. But Imam Sayyidina Imam Suyuti rahimahullah, he says, I am the first one who did it. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, right? Uh, Imam al Nawawi, and you see the Imma. Imam al Nawawi fil Majmu' says, right? Wahad al Hadith, wa in lam yakun thabitan, famahnahu sahih. This Hadith, though it's weak, it doesn't really exist, has 50 different chains. But he says, ghir thabit, it's not really there, it's not authentic. Like in the meaning is okay, which is right. And that's the difference between saying this is law versus hey, this is a good statement. This is wisdom. Difference because law is law. Good statement is good statement. I, you know, it's, it's subject to your uh, things. Okay. So I think I should, I, I put other examples just for some people to realize uh, that you know it's it's not necessarily I also put a chapter on the ziyada of the fiqh for example uh, oh, I, I'll tell you some of the effects of, of being uh, of athar of, liftiraq of having this division in the ummah and now when I say division I mean a lot, a lot of people when I say I love my Muslim Wahhabi brothers and now I'm telling you I'm Ash'ari in Aqidah and I am Shafi'i in Fiqh and I'm Junaidi Ghazali in Tasawwuf Right? You may agree, you disagree, I still love you. But when I say I love my Wahhabi, Muslim Wahhabi brothers, and I love my Muslim uh, Khawarij brothers, and I love my Muslim Shia brothers, and I love my Muslim Mu'tazili brothers, and I love my, what else is there? Also, Khawarij, anyone who's Muslim, me, I'm, I love them. Though I may have irreconcilable differences with them, on methodology and actually some serious issues. Having said that, when I say that the ummah is ummah, I'm not saying that we have no irreconcilable differences. We do, absolutely. But so long you're still Muslim, yani still la ilaha illallah is there, I, you have my respect and love 
despite my irreconcilable jurisprudential and constitutional difference with you. Once you leave Islam, now we have, it's a different deen altogether. But so long it's la ilaha illallah, look, la ilaha illallah to me is good enough. It's big enough. And I may never see eye to eye with you. I am not saying here that that means we should stop refuting people of bid'ah. Absolutely the opposite. Right? I am just saying that within the borders of Islam, we need to understand that my way is not the only way necessarily. Even if I actually strongly think it is this way, and that is intra-Islamic, not just intra al sunnah In the old days, we had just three sects, Sunnah, al sunnah Shia, and Khawarij. Today, within al sunnah we have from one extreme, extreme radical jihad, radical Salafism, to, to radical Sufism. Takfir, what I mean by radical, I mean takfiri Sufism and takfiri Salafism. Everybody is kafir but us. Everybody is kafir but us. Right? I'm not saying, again, w within the rules of the book and the sunnah, kufr can be kuf declared kufr based on such. But it's important not to reduce the deen into one understanding versus the other, especially if the, the parameters of the book and the sunnah are not breached in that. So despite our irreconcilable, my irreconcilable differences with many of the Muslim sects today, especially the main ones, being, being from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah anyway, yani Ash'ari Maturidi, Shafi'i Hanafi, uh, Ghazali Junaidi Sufi, and I say Ghazali Junaidi Sufi, so we understand what kind of tasawwuf we're looking at. So, yani Al Habith Al Muhasibi kind of Sufism, Sufism or Tazkiyah, or Al, al Junaid Al Baghdadi kind of Sufism and Tazkiyah, that's the kind of Sufism and Tazkiyah. It doesn't mean we don't, we have irreconcilable differences, sure. We extend our hands to everybody. We give them the love that Allah afforded us to give to all human beings, first of all, to fellow people who declare Allah is our Lord. Muhammad is still our prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Quran is still our book. And we try, if we can work our differences, we will try. If we can't, we declare we have irre seriously irreconcilable differences. Your way is one, our way is one. Allah is the judge in the day of judgment. Uh, I will refute what in what I can the bid'ahs that I see without character assassination the people I think in the people of bid'ah there are many sincere people from my perspective genuinely misguided love Allah love his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam love the Quran love Islam but in my view they're misguided and I will try to uh, or misunderstand things, I will try to present it in an academic way with love for them and love for me, not holding myself to be self-righteous, but holding myself to the standard, which is the Quran and the authentic prophetic sunnah, which we can all agree on as Muslims. And I think if we do that, maybe there is a way in, this, in these very sick times of ours to have to make some sense uh, instead of the political and sectarian polarization that is leading to violence and hate. Hate, imagine a religion that comes to give the world rahma lil alameen becomes hate lil alameen if you're not like me. There's a problem with that. There's a problem with that approach, not withholding that one cannot accept a bid'ah if it's a bid'ah, nor can endorse a bid'ah. This is not an endorsement of a bid'ah, nor an acceptance of a bid'ah, not even tolerating of a bid'ah. In fact, it's a call to refute the bid'ah, but refute the bid'ah billatihi ahsan, bi akhlaq al muslimin with the ethics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Because uh, the goal is, and you know what, sometimes we will always be different. Only Allah is the judge. You know, but we will do what we can. That's the point. So that's what I want to get from here. And um, I, I don't have a problem saying I love all Muslims. I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have to apologize for loving all Muslims, irrespective of what they are. So long they're Muslims, they have my love and respect, regardless what kind of bid'ah they have. Not that I agree to their bid'ah, nor do I endorse their bid'ah, nor do I think their bid'ah is good. I may think their bid'ah is extremely evil and destructive and bad and spiritually bankrupting and divisive. But guess what? 
La ilaha illallah is very big, and La ilaha illallah brings us all together. This remains the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu And guess what? The saved sect is not the one that's trying to lock everybody in Jahannam. The saved sect is the one that's trying to work hard to save everyone from Jahannam. So that's how I look at it. And wallahu a'lam, yani this is not the final word in anything, right? The reason for this iftiraq or this division and my sect is now we see intra ahl sunnah in the old days we saw just intra-Islamic and there were three major sects ahl sunnah al jamaah the Shia with their sects and the Khawarij today in every sect you have every intra oh no we are the right ones these guys are evil oh, ajib our prophet I always say sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to appeal to the best in us not to the worst in us. And you've got to be careful of those who want to appeal to the worst in you. Because that's not our deen. Appealing to the best in us to do the best. Anyway, uh, some of the effects of having this 73 and everyone is the 73rd and the rest are all in Jahannam. Obviously, you see the ummah, the situation of the ummah today. Today, we, there's fatawas of killing each other because of a theological disagreement. While everyone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, not good enough. That's not good enough. What kind of Muslim are you? Are you from my jama'ah, my masjid, my people, or you're from the others? Because if you're from the others, I'm going to legislate hate against you, even though you're a Muslim. In flagrant violation of the prophetic message and all its core principles and mission, that doesn't become a religion. That becomes something else. And those who appeal to the to the worst in us are trying to make shaitan out of us. The Prophet ﷺ appealed to the best in us to make us more angels close to that rather than shayateen. Right? So number two also, uh, these kind of divis divisiveness is what leads to what? The ulama, du'at, al-wa'ad, al-hukam, al-ummah. We suspect everyone to be evil. The ulama are evil. So long you're not from my jama'ah, if you're a alim, you're evil. If you're a da'iyah, you're also evil. You're not my jama'ah. If you're a preacher, wa'az, you're also evil. If you're a hakim, if, you don't, if I'm not with you, then you're also evil. Uh, the whole ummah is evil if you're not like me. Right? And also using the shaitani way, like I said, to appeal to the worst in people, people to be against others. We say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Do reform, repair, billet islah, billet hi ahsan. That leads also to alleviating the barakah from the whole ummah, to be honest with you, from many of it. There's no barakah. Allah says, La khayra min fi kathirin min najwahum. Right? And also, it deprives the ummah from, from celebrating diversity, celebrating the enrichment that the academic enrichment due to that different views celebrate making the ummah making unity equal conformity which should never be the case we should unity should never mean conformity we can be united we don't have to conform you have abu hanifa or shafi abu hanifa or malik shafi or malik the Imam Shafi'i wrote a book against one of his shiuch, which was Malik. Kitab al raddi ala Malik. With respect and love, no problem. It's, that's where we want to have clash of minds. I say at Medina always. I want to have clash of minds. I want to create a culture where we have clash of minds, not clash of hearts. Clash of minds yield the best. Parroting is not scholarship. Memorizing information is not scholarship. Is knowledge, application of knowledge, creativity in that knowledge. That's what scholars were. We want to create a clash of minds, but not with buzzwords and make belief, with actual studies and scholarship. That's what I believe. And when we try to seek conformity, we're trying to make a sheep, a herd mentality. You can't think and don't ever dare to question. How dare you say, why? Excuse me? Why should be the, day, the order of the day every day? If you want to create a Muslim generation that actually understands its, its reality and, 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 and challenges, you better teach them how to ask every question, and you better be prepared to give them a full answer and step down from your high horse. Because all of us are followers of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ is your direct imam. Nobody else is done. 
right? That also takes the ummah from its priorities. The priority becomes how do I make this group looks evil? Not the other, the house is burning, no problem. Atheism taking over, no problem. People are going crazy and violence, no problem. I just need to fight these people, even though they're praying everything, but these guys are evil, I need to take them down. That's your priorities. The whole fiqh of priorities is all over. And therefore, there's no more the shu'ur of the ummah uh, that it is one ummah. It's really like one group, not one ummah anymore, unfortunately. And I think this is done now. Or what does it say? I don't know these, all these, oh, there we go. All these high techs, right? And also suspicion of people, hearts hating each other. We don't call for the path of Allah, we call for groups now. Hizbu jama'a, which hizb are you part of? Ya akhi, ud'u ila sabili rabbika. Wa anna al-masajida lillah. Al-shahada lillah. Not to anybody else. So I think, I'm not saying it's not, you should not be part of a group or a jama'a or a madhab. Please be. But don't think that you, mere association with that group or madhab or jama'a makes you better than the others. That's all. Right. Uh, a couple of things, and I'll finish, I promise now. When we look at some issue, first we need to have faham and istiqra, comprehensive understanding. Number two, we need to make sure that actually what's been said about the others is authentic. Tahrir mahal niza, al insaf fil khilaf. We need to be fair. Number two, we need to also, uh, number three, we need to also uh, re re revive uh, self criticism. Uh, number f number nine here. We need to actually glorify the commons that we have amongst us. Number uh, uh, 10, we need to leave the matters of differences to those who are actually specialists in the field. Not everybody is a man of everything. Uh, and we should never allow a language of hate or walls of hate to be erected under the banners of love and mercy within the Ummah. Never. Never. Right? بحسب امرئ النبي صلى الله عليه واله وسلم تلز في صحيح مسلم من الشر enough evil in you ان يحقر اخاه المسلم that you actually have a grudge or belittlement against your fellow brother we need to talk we don't have to agree but we need to talk right والله اعلم so i also put الخلاف السائغ والمعتبر فصل في الخلاف السائغ and then i put the what i think the saved sect is Right? And the saved sect, what Allah says, the saved sect are. ثُمَّ نُنَجِّي رُسُولَنَا وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ نُنَجِّي الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوا That's the firqa al-Najiyah. That Allah actually said they are Najiyah. Right? وَنَذَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا Etc. So, anything about the saved sect is in the Qur'an. Once the Qur'an says, نُنَجِّي نَجَى إِتْسَ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي You know, those are the Najiyin. Other than that, people make whatever they want to do. As far as, last thing, as far as the, who is the Muslim and the hukuk of the Muslim on the Muslim, not the hukuk of the mu'min over the mu'min, because nowadays we can, we pretend to have thermometers of iman. So we check your iman. Today your iman is no good because you're not like me. But if you become like me, mashallah, your iman is very nice now. So that's why I resorted just to bare Islam. What is the, Hukuk of Muslim over the Muslim. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Bukhari mentioned hadith Anas, man salla salatana, whoever prays our salah, faces our qibla, eats our dhabiha, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not me, he says, فَذَلِكَ الْمُسْلِمْ الَّذِي لَهُ ذِمَّةُ اللَّهِ وَذِمَّةُ رَسُولِهِ That's the Muslim that Allah Ta'ala commanded you to dignify and honor and not to violate any of his rights. This is Islam. This is who the Muslim is according to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Azwaji Wasallam. Right? Uh, and the rights of Muslims over Muslims, you know. Al Hadith Fisail Bukhari Muslim, both Al Muslim, Akhul Muslim. La Yazlimo, Wala Yuslimo, Wala Yahkum, and Kana Fi Hajati Akhi, Kana Allah Fi Hajati, La Tahasadu, Wala Tanajashu, Wala Tabagadu, Wala Tadabaru. وَلَا يَبِيعُ بَعْضُكُمْ عَلَى بَيْعِ بَعْضُ وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانَ المسلم أَخُوا المسلم The Muslim is the brother of the Muslim. I mean, I, I don't know how many times the Prophet ﷺ needs to tell us this, 
right? Ibn Umar mentions it, Abu Huraira mentions it, Anas mentions it, I don't know. La yazlimu, la yakhdulu, la yahqiru. بحسب امرئ من الشر أن يحقر أخاه المسلم كل المسلم على المسلم حرام all the Muslim is sacred on the Muslim his blood, his honor, his reputation, his property yeah, yeah. straightforward these are hadith right? من نفس على مسلم كربة من كرب الدنيا أبو داود actually mentions the in his Sunan you know, with the Hassan Sanad on Abi Barz al Aslami, the Prophet said, Ya ma'ashara man amana bilisanih, walam yadhul il imanu kalba. O you who say you believe in your tongue, but iman has not entered your hearts. La taghtabu al muslimin. Do not backbite the muslimin. Wala tattabi'u awratihim. And do not follow their faults and try to make yourself uh, exposer of the faults of others. فَإِنَّهُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ عَوْرَاتَهُمْ يَتَّبِعُ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ For whoever follows the faults of the Muslims, Allah Ta'ala will expose him, if not now, on the Day of Judgment. Another hadith in Bukhari Muslim, سِبَابُ الْمُسْلِمِ فُسُوق Slandering Muslims. Muslim, not mu'min. Slandering a Muslim is an act of fusfisq, deviation. And that's why in Bukhari Muslim also, Al-Muslim man salim al-Muslimun. The Muslim is the one who Muslims are safe from the harms of his tongue and his hand. All these things. Abu Dawood also with an authentic sanad says, and Sa'id bin Zayd, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, inna min arba riba. Right? You know how riba is. But the most riba of all riba, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, is talking about the dignity and the honor of your fellow Muslim brother. All right. So I think I'm going to hear another hadith Muslim narrated in his Sahih. I'll finish with that. For those who threaten other Muslims, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi says, Man ashara ila akhihi bi hadida. Whoever tries to threaten another Muslim, even with a piece of iron, فَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تَلْعَنُهُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ is cursing him until he stops. All right. So all I want to say is some of these things that we talk about, that the ramification of applying this hadith with its weak additions to the reality of the ummah, where you're actually taking scissors and cutting off the fabric of the ummah and throwing it here and there in Jahannam. You want to believe in the hadith that's authentic? Bismillah, that's your freedom to do so. Uh, though I think it's weak, definitely the additions are weak. Uh, the asal of the hadith, you want to believe in it's weak, at least take it in a way that's constructive, not destructive. That's my plea for you and dua. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan jaza. This is an unbelievable session. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve the shaykh because he made the impossibility a possibility. To put all of this in this short session, it's not easy. And I know many people, when we walk into our new campus today, we said, wow, look at the beauty of the campus, the carpets, the construction, the sound system, the whole layout is amazing. But it's not anymore about the decor. It's about the experience. It's what you learn at Medina that makes this place the most beautiful. It's the knowledge, it's the ilm, it's the analytical deduction, and looking at things with a consistent methodology that makes this place not only wow, but double wow. So I think we've got a lot more than we asked for this afternoon, and this is what I call a proper launch. If you want to launch an ilmi institute, you do it with ilm. And alhamdulillah, Sayyidi, Jazakumullah khairan jaza. I think there's many, many multiple dimensions, not only the aspect of the hadith that was analyzed, but many, many other dimensions about many other matters that came out to this dars. And we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on this path of seeking knowledge. Yatlubu fi ilman sahalallahu lahu tariqan ilal jannah. Inshallah, kama qal, sadaqtiya rasulullah kareem.